But listen, I, I, we have fun with that song, but uh, there's a lot of truth to it, amen. Uh, do you know that when Hank Williams wrote that song, Sr. wrote that song, uh, they would not let him play that on the radio as a gospel song. And uh, so, uh, boy, we've, we've come a long way since back then. But anyway, but I hope you enjoyed that. And at this time, we're going to go ahead and cut Children's Church loose. And so they'll be taken care of. Don't forget now, kids, uh, y'all sign the contract one and done. So if you act up, what happens? You back up here and you get to sit behind the preacher, and Eric's going to zoom in on you and put you on our live feed, on our website, and on YouTube, and all that kind of stuff, and you'll become famous. Amen. Is that a good enough threat, adults? What y'all laughing at? Hey, it's the same for y'all now. Amen. Y'all are on TV too. All right. All right. Everybody else this morning, good to see you in the house of the Lord. Eric, I'm going to switch over here. Wireless. Amen. And uh, I want you to take your Bibles this morning, if you will. Again, it's good to be in the house of the Lord, and I want you to turn your Bibles to the book of Luke, the book of Luke this morning. Uh, again, I like singing, but nothing replaces the preaching of the Word of God. Amen. And uh, I believe that singing is like an appetizer, and it gets, gets you ready for the uh, main course and the buffet. And uh, so this morning, I'd like for you to uh, look with me, if you will, to the book of Luke, chapter number 24. You say, preacher, it's not uh, Easter time. Uh, are you going to? Pre you're preaching on the crucifixion, uh, and yes, I am. Uh, I want to tell you something. Uh, we've become a society that we think certain messages are geared uh, for certain times of the year. Uh, we believe the prodigal son ought to be preached at homecoming, and we believe that uh, the crucifixion on Good Friday and Easter weekend, and and so on and so forth. But I'm here to tell you today. This Bible is to be preached, amen, from A to Z, cover to cover, and there's not a set time to preach it, amen. But I want to help you this morning with this message, and while you get in your place this morning, I want to give you a little bit of history. I like history. Uh, in the year 1863, uh, three small brothers, uh, small hometown brothers, all three were actors. They joined together to appear in a play that we're all familiar with. The play was called Julius Caesar. Uh, one brother, Edwin, had a rose to fame at 15 by performing Richard III. Uh, he was followed by people all around the world. They thought that they'd never seen a performance as uh, Edwin had done in the play Richard III. And uh, he followed it up with a play that you might be familiar with, the play Hamlet, which was shown in New York City 100 consecutive nights. And so people, uh, Edwin became very famous uh, by his acting on Broadway. Uh, but it came, uh, when it came to tragedy performed on a stage, uh, people said Edwin was lights out and he was uh, considered to be uh, in a select group of actors that could pull off uh, tragic events in these type of plays. Uh, the same could also be said about the tragedy of life. His two brothers he had, John and Junius, joined him on stage to perform Julius Caesar. Uh, John took on the role of Brutus, uh, which in hindsight was very eerie based on the events that would happen just two years later after this play. Uh, the same John who played the killer in Julius Caesar was also the same John who took on the role of a killer in Ford's Theater in real life. In April of 1865, you may have heard of this, he entered the rear of a Washington theater and fired a kill shot into the back of then-president Abraham Lincoln. The brothers Edwin Thomas Booth and Junius and John Wilkes Booth. Edwin was near the same, never the same after that fateful night because of what his brother done. Because of the shame of the brother's actions, he would retire. He would go into a seclusion. Uh, he would eventually continue act to, uh, excuse me, acting after rescuing a man who lost his footing on a train platform and nearly fell in front of a train to his death. Edwin Booth grabbed the young man and pulled him to safety. Edwin didn't recognize the man until weeks later after receiving a letter that he would carry to his grave. The letter was from the chief secretary to General Ulysses S. Grant. The letter was to thank Edwin Booth for saving the life of this child who belonged to an American hero. That American hero was President Abraham Lincoln. The irony in that one brother killed the president while the other brother saved the president's son. The man who was saved was none other than Robert Todd Lincoln. How about that? How about that? It's amazing how life intertangles uh, and intertwines. And, and, and I, when I was reading that story, I was amazed. See, one brother chose murder while the other brother chose life. 
And it is amazing because as you look at these brothers, they're on a different path and spectrum. They have the same father, they have the same mother, they have the same profession, they have the same passion for acting, and yet one chooses death and the other chooses life. And so their story reminds me of a few stories that I've read in the Word of God uh, that uh, makes the Booth brothers' story really not that unique. See, there was a man in the Bible named Adam, and he had two sons called Cain and Abel. One chose God, the other chose murder. And God lets them do what their heart desire was to do. Abraham and Lot. Abraham chooses God, and we know that Lot pitches his tent towards what? Sodom. And God lets him do it. David and Saul, I preached on them for the last couple of weeks. Both are kings. David chooses God, and Saul chooses power and popularity. And yes, God allows him to do that. Peter and Judas, both of them denied Jesus. One betrayed Jesus. Peter looks for mercy after he done it. He realized what he'd done once he had denied the Lord Jesus. But yet, Peter finds mercy and Judas finds death. And God lets him do that. Folks, all throughout history and through the Word of God, people make decisions and God lets them make their own choices. God lets them make their own choices. This morning I want to preach on this thought that the Lord's laid on my heart this week. He lets you choose. He lets you choose. Let's look at one story that we've heard about in the Word of God, but people look at it differently. I want to look at the, uh, Luke chapter number 23 and verse number 32. Luke 23, verse 32, the Bible says, And there were also two other malefactors, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him, and the malefactors, one on the right and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now I want you to notice something in your Bible that is in those words are in red. Jesus said, Father, forgive. He didn't say one of them. He didn't, he didn't call out one, and He didn't call out the other. He says, forgive them, that is plural. He says, forgive them both, for they know not what they do. And they parted His raiment, cast lots, and the people stood, beholding. And the rulers also with them derided Him, saying, He saved others, let Him save Himself, if He be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked Him, coming to Him, and offering Him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and of Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Now look at verse number 39. And one, catch that again, and one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condition? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. And Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now, I want you to turn your Bibles back over just a, another book, and I want you to look at the book of Matthew chapter number 27 just a minute. Now we know that the Gospels, uh, they give different accounts, different perspectives, different thoughts on things uh, that were seen. But I want you to notice something that Matthew says here in Matthew chapter number 27 and verse... Hold on, let me make sure I got my right verse here. Matthew 27 verse 44. Matthew 27 and verse number 44. The Bible says, "...the thieves also which were crucified with Him." It says thieves now, remember that's plural, cast the same in his teeth. Preacher, why'd you take us back to show us? Well, I'll sit here to let you know that both of the criminals that hung beside Jesus, both railed against him. Both had things to say about him. The one thief that at the very end that received mercy, he started off doing the same thing as the other thief did. And so I don't want you to miss that in the message today. And so... Jesus speaks very clearly in the Word of God about the free will that is given to every man and 
uh, woman, every boy, boy and girl. You've got a free will today to choose. All right? You've got a free will to choose many different things. Last night, Sherry and I, we went and visited Miss Sue. I was about to starve. And uh, so we, uh, I said, listen, I don't want to go in anywhere and eat. I want to get home so we could finish studying some more or whatever. And uh, so we decided to go into Culver's. And so, it, by the way, they got good hamburgers. We went into Culver's, and uh, they have a huge menu up. And when I went in, Miss Linda, I looked up at the menu, and I said, give me a minute. You know why I needed a minute? Because I had to decide what I wanted to eat. And they had a lot of things. You ever been to a restaurant? They got a menu and it takes you about 10 minutes to look because they got so much stuff. And so I'm up here and I'm looking at a, 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 a hamburger basket and I'm looking at seafood and I'm looking at this. And of course, their mixers, their concrete mixers, uh, those good old uh, ice cream shakes that they've got, all these choices. And so I made a decision on what I would have. Sherry made a decision on what she would have. Now, can I tell you something that did not happen to me in the restaurant? When I walked in the restaurant, Brother Tim, they didn't say, hey, you're getting a cod sandwich, and you're getting a, uh, you know, a, a tuna sandwich. Now, that wouldn't give me much free will, would it? That wouldn't give me the opportunity to make my decision. And so I'm thankful that we are allowed to make decisions. Uh, others, other decisions. Uh, you go and you're in a hurry. Uh, this is kind of annoying sometimes, but you go and you order hamburger. And you order a hamburger and you think it's going to be quick or cheeseburger. Well, what kind of bun would you want? Well, I didn't realize I had a choice. You want wheat or you want white or you want this. Well, what, what kind of cheese do you want? I want the yellow kind, that square that goes on the burger, right? I mean, that's what I want to say to them. And, but, but they'll say American or, and they don't stop. Swiss, Greek, the, I mean, they list every country in the, Romania. I mean, you know what I'm saying. But, you know, but by the time you go to fast food and try to order and everything, You've been given a lot of choices to make. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that I'm given choices, that it's just not forced on me. I'm thankful whenever we decided to buy our home that the realtor didn't come up to me and say, well, listen, according to Joe Biden's new realtor's uh, law, uh, this is the house that you get regardless of how big your family is. You get a one-bedroom, one-bath, and it's going to need some fixing up, but that's your house. That's what you get. I wouldn't be very, very happy with that. And so I'm thankful that we are allowed to make decisions. And so, but there is a, uh, decision making has a lot of responsibility and a lot of consequences, all right? But if you're allowed to make your own decision, guess who the ultimate consequences fall back on? It falls on you. It's not my fault. It's not God's fault. If you make a decision and you've got a choice, it's your fault. So you live with the good or you live with the bad. Now, the lottery is up to about $1.9 billion now. Huh. I hear some of you laughing. Now, you know how I feel about the lottery. Now, don't tell me if you play it, because I'm going to tell you it's sin. But I'm also going to tell you that if you win it, remember where your membership is. Amen. <laughs> so... My wife said one time she's going to sneak out, she's going to buy a lottery ticket. And I said, please don't tell me that. Now, she don't play it, but I said, please don't tell me. But I said, now, you know you're married to me if you win. What's well, yours is mine, and what's mine is mine. And so, but anyway, but here's the thing. If you decide to go out here, and like some people do, that they, they, you know, they have more months than money. They scrape and scrounge around to try to pay bills. But then they'll go into a store and they'll spend twenty, thirty, forty, hundred dollars on lottery tickets that they don't have. Now, if they hit it, it paid off, didn't it? But if they miss it and they lose, which chances are they will, they've already spent some of that money for their power bill. And then they're calling the church, and they don't even go here, and they're saying, "Hey, preacher, do y'all help people with their power bills?" I mean, I get this all the time. But my answer machine every week is somebody looking for something. And y'all know me, I will help anybody. I give the shirt off of my back with one stipulation, you've got to come to church. It's amazing how people forget how cold they are whenever you tell them you've got to come to church. So we'll thank you anyway and they hang the phone up. Choices have consequences, folks. And I want you to understand that. But I want you to understand that He lets you choose. He who? God. God lets you choose this morning. Jesus spoke clearly about the free will that's given to people. In Matthew chapter number 7, he says, you get to choose between a narrow and a wide gate. He says you get to choose between a narrow and a wide road. He says you get to choose between a big crowd that's on their way to hell or a smaller crowd that's on their way to heaven. 
had a preacher preach one time. I totally disagree with him. We butted heads about this a lot. He said, I believe there's going to be more people in heaven than hell. No, there is not. The Bible doesn't say that heaven is enlarging. The Bible says hell is enlarging. Why? Because so many people are on that broad path, that wide path, and they're lost and they're hell bound. But Jesus says, I'm going to give you a choice. He also says that we can choose to build on a rock or we can choose to build on the sand. But he also says there's consequences, right? He says in Matthew 6, we can decide to serve God or we can decide to, decide to serve our money. Folks, let me, let me explain something to you about money. I know everybody loves it. I know it supposedly makes the world go round. Actually, it don't. God does. But can I tell you something today? It does not matter how much money you have. Money cannot buy happiness, and you think it can, but it don't. If you look at Hollywood, look how miserable these people are. Would you look at them? Yeah, they've got money. They've got yachts. They've got all this kind of stuff. But they're marrying seven and eight times, and they're doing this and they're doing that. And Tom Brady gave up his family for his football career, and he's almost my age. And, and the love of money, people are chasing money, but they don't have happiness. So when you die, again, no U-Haul behind the hearse. You're not going to have all your money uh, unless you're just that selfish stuffed in your casket. See, money does not make the world go round. And so God gives you a choice. You can choose between the almighty dollar or you can choose in the almighty God. But He's given you a choice. What a fair God that is. He's not making you love Him. The Bible says He's not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. He wants everybody to be saved. But He does not make you. It's a choice you'll make. In Matthew 25, we can choose to be numbered with the sheep or we can, be, we can choose to be numbered with the goats. Again, we have a choice. All these choices, but one sticks out that is the most important of, important of all is in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 46. This is what the Bible says. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. God gives you a choice. Today, if you're here, you've got a choice. You do not have to die and go to hell. But it's your choice. Now, in our minds, we would think you have got to be absolutely out of your mind to want to die and go to hell. But people make that choice every day. They say, you know what, I can't get rid of the needle out of my arm. I can't, I can't get the powder out of my nose. I can't get the alcohol out of my throat. I can't stop sleeping around with everybody on the block. I can't do this. I can't do that. I, 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 my life will be miserable. I won't have any fun. I can't wait to marriage to have sex. I can't. And it's on and on and on and on. And what they're saying is, you know what, I choose hell over heaven. That's what it is. Folks, this thing's winding down. We're not going to be here much longer. I don't, I don't care what you believe. No, I'm not Nostradamus and I'm not predicting, but I believe this generation will see the return of the Lord Jesus. I believe with all my heart. I, you can just look. Everything is lined up. There's nothing else that has to be fulfilled other than Jesus stepping on the clouds, the trumpet sounding, and the church rising. That's all. It can happen today. But you get to decide where you go. You can choose to go up with the church or you can choose to stay around for the seven years of tribulation. And then the lake of fire, your choice. What a loving God to give you that choice. He doesn't make you do anything. Isn't that something? But you know what's funny? I have never heard any, anybody ever really say this. And God made me do it. But boy, they'll say, and the devil made me do it quick, right? Who makes you do the bad stuff? The devil. And you know what? God will give you a choice. You can listen to him or you can listen to Satan. It's your choice. So we're all given choices. And some of these choices that we make, one in particular is going to have eternal consequences. See, it reminds me of the trio on the hill of Mount Calvary. You know, when we look at, we got a cross out here in the front yard and Boy, when I'm up here mowing, I tell you what, and I know this might sound ridiculous to some of you, I don't care. Listen, I'm saved, I'm not ashamed, I'm not embarrassed. If somebody comes by here and I'm kneeling at that cross or crying at that cross or hanging on that cross or crawling on it or sitting on top of it, I don't care what people think. Because that cross is the reason that I'm here, He's the reason I live, He's the one that's given me a home in heaven, forgiven me my sins, and He's the one that gives me joy, so I don't give a flip what people think. But I'm often, when I'm out here mowing, 
And it is so surreal when you take that moor and you go and you get right there to the foot of the cross. And I think, Lord, please always keep me here. Please keep me here and always remind me of what you did. Because there's, you know, in this life things come and, boy, we get aggravated. And I, was, I always say this. I was telling somebody the other day, I said, you know, pastor, and of course I've said this a lot, pastoring it would be so easy if it wasn't for the people. And there's a lot of truth to that, honestly. Uh, you deal with so much. And, and there's times that you're on a mountain and you're in a valley and you're getting torn and you got church people's problems, you got your own problems, you got family problems. And boy, I just say, you know what, sometimes it, it would be easy to just throw your hands up and quit. But then I'm reminded of the cross. And I'm reminded that Jesus didn't quit. And so that's what gives me the strength to go on. So... But when I was putting the message together, I was thinking about choices. And I was thinking about the three crosses on Golgotha's hill. Now, have you ever wondered? Maybe y'all don't. I'm just goofy like this sometimes. But I wonder sometimes. I'm like, you know, I wonder why, why wasn't there eight crosses on Calvary? Or four? I mean, think about it. Crucifixion was a big thing by the Romans. I mean, that's, that's, that was their way to put people to death. And I'm sure there was a whole lot more people that was on death row than just Jesus and these two criminals. And so, have you ever thought and wondered why there were only three crosses there? I do. I was, when I, was, I was like, you know what, I kind of wonder about that. On that day, there were only three people that were condemned to die on that particular day. Now, and then I thought about this. Jesus was in the center of the three crosses. Why wasn't He on the right? Why wasn't He on the left? Why do they have them all in a row? I mean, you know, I mean, was there, was there symbolism behind this? So I got to thinking about that too. And so, and I'm just throwing this out here. Could it be that the two crosses on either side symbolize one of God's greatest gifts, the gift of a free will? You say, preacher, what do you mean? Well, think about it. We have two criminals, and we've got the Son of God, the Lamb of God, that takes away the sins of the world. We've got a choice to make. Both of those men on the cross had a choice to make. You can choose to be the thief on the cross that is unrepentant, that, that rails against Jesus. You can choose to be the one on the other side that is looking for mercy, right? But what, what do both of them have in common? The man in the middle. The man in the middle. Because can I tell you something? For the one thief on the cross to go to heaven, he's got to go through the door. John 10, 9, Jesus said, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So he's the door. He's the same door that Judas kissed and died and went to hell through. Judas, all he had to do is push it open and go through it. But he didn't. So for that man to go to heaven, he had to go through the door. And that was the middle man on the cross. But can I tell you something else? For the other man to die and go to hell, he still had the opportunity. He was right there, that close. Can I tell you something? The crosses were equally distant. If you ever look at a picture of the crosses, there's not a cross at that window and then a cross right here and then a cross way back there. Right? They're equally apart from the cross the same. Or you can say they were both as close to the cross. They were both in the same distance of Jesus. One shows life, and the other one shows death. Think about that this morning. God gives us our choices. And can I tell you something? When both of those men made their choices that day, God let them. God didn't say, hey, wait a minute, before the temper veil is ripped in, uh, in two, and uh, before the thunder and the lightning starts, and before Jesus says it's finished, and before he, he bows his head and gives up the ghost, and before the demons are racing through the sky saying, hey, we've won, and we've killed him, and all that, before all of that happened, nowhere in the Bible does it say that God said, hey, I'm going to take about 15 more minutes, and I'm going to let Jesus preach a little bit longer, and maybe this uh, sinner over here will get saved. That's not what he done. He gave him a choice. That man could have opened his mouth and been in heaven today. But he made a choice. What kind of choice are you going to make today? What, what, what kind of choices are your friends going to make or your family members going to make? Because every one of us have a free will. So, these two male factors or criminals have more in common than we realize. Can I tell you something? They were both convicted by the same 
legal system. Whether you agree with it or not, we know that Jesus' uh, trial was the, the, the biggest sham in history. We know that it was not based on uh, it was not based on real law. It, you know, everything took place behind the scenes and all that kind of thing. People say oh, the O.J. Simpson trial was the worst. No, the the trial of Jesus Christ was the biggest sham in history. So they got a lot in common. They were both convicted by the same system. They were both condemned to the same death. And interestingly enough, they were both surrounded by the same crowd. The same crowd that wanted Jesus to die on the cross was the same crowd that also wanted to see these men die. See, public execution back in that day was kind of popular. Well, what do you mean? You've got to be sick to want to... Well, how many people you think were out there? The Bible says there were crowds of people. They wanted to see it. You say, well, they got a sick sense of humor. Why don't you think about this today? How many of you watch Forensic Files or any of those kind of TV shows on A&E and all ID channel? And Man, I mean, you watch and, boy, they kill people. And boy, Like Sharon and I were watching one last night and I fell asleep. I might have to go home because I DVR'd it. I want to see, you know, who, who was it? Was it the sun or what? That draws us in. And can I tell you something about people? People are nosy. Now, some of you that say amen, and I'm not saying, I heard amens over on this side. I'm not saying it. I'm not saying you're no. I'm just saying you, you said the amen. I didn't make you say that. You had a choice. But, uh, so I have a choice to say what I'm going to say right now. But can I tell you some of the nosiest people in the world? Church people are some of the nosiest people in the world. They want to know everything. They think when you go to the bathroom to use the bathroom, you need to post it on Facebook. They think that you need to let them know. Every time you go somewhere, who you pray for, what, what's going on in somebody's life, what's going on in their financial life, what you're doing at somebody's house so many times in a week, blah, 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 blah. Church people are nosy. And they think that because, listen, there are church people that think that the pastor answers to them on his schedule. I got news for you. And this, hey, this is, this, is, this is a longer news than just a, a, a Fox News alert, amen? That's not the way it works. But some people are just generally nosy. And I guarantee you that sometimes, and I'm not saying ladies because men do it too, y'all get together and buddy, y'all sit and y'all, I told my wife, I, I, I'd like to be in a fly on the wall with the women's retreat when they went out of town this weekend, what they were talking about. Sherry said, oh, we talked and talked and talked and talked. And I was thinking, well, Regina was there. I know y'all talked, amen. And, uh, but uh, and she's like, Stephanie can talk too. And I was like, well, all right. And then and my wife can talk. And, but I'd like to be on a fly on the wall to hear what they had to talk about. I'd like to be a fly on the wall, Miss Marsha, and hear what some other people in the church talk about, amen, and what they think that they need to know. But can I tell you something? You're in, you're in the same crowd as the people that stood on Calvary's hill because they showed up. They wanted to see blood and guts. They wanted to see people tortured and hung on crosses. And I mean, you know what? They were nosy. Independent Baptists are some of the worst. Can I tell you? They, I mean, really are. Things that really don't concern us, we think we've got a need to know. Whatever happened to going, honestly, to the bathroom and not sitting on your phone I remember back in the day, and, I, and I'm 52 years old. I know I don't look a day over 20, but I'm 52. But listen to me. And I just wear these to try to fit in with y'all. Amen. I can see fine. But I remember a day that if you ever went to the bathroom and tried to get that cord, and we had some long cords. I mean, I remember we had a cord hanging in the kitchen that was like this long. But remember, those things are doubled. So, uh, listen, a, a cellular phone back then, I mean, you had to take the cord through the house. You'd knock over lamps, get them stuck in the door, all that kind of stuff. But I can tell you one thing. Not one time do I ever remember going to the toilet and doing my business and holding a phone in the toilet. Never. Right? Because we closed the door back then. Amen? And I was afraid it'd cut the cord off. Right? You want to block and delete people? That's how you do it back in the day. Amen? Just shut the bathroom door on that cord. But listen to me. Everybody today thinks that they got a right to know everything, and they don't. And people, can I tell you something? And I'm going to get back in the message, and got about 15 minutes, you're going to be fine. All the restaurants, food's still going to be hot, and they're still going to be short of workers, and you're still going to be waiting. But listen to me. That's another message. When, let me, let me. Oh, Lord, thank you, Lord. I'm so glad I'm saved today, amen. I just, I am. But listen, I'll tell you something. 
Seriously. People really believe that they are entitled to be in every single part of your life. And when we go on Facebook and we post stuff, I've had people to honestly, Gary, they need oxygen because I haven't done a Facebook post in two days. I've had people that I've not, that, that maybe they hadn't heard from me in a day or something. They'll call me and say, Preacher, are you all right? I'm thinking, well, hold on, let me check. Oh, yeah, I'm good. Well, I ain't seen you post nothing. You ain't checked in nowhere. What are you doing? Well, what's the church paying you for? Seriously. Now, I'm going to ruffle a feather here, and I don't care because God's put this on my heart, and I'm changing serious mode. But I went to the hospital a couple of days and visited somebody who I consider a friend that is not a member of our church, and I got a, sh I got a swipe on Facebook because I visited because somebody decided to go on there and let me know that their pastor visits and keeps them abreast and all that. Almost like there was jealousy there. I want to tell you something. I don't care. Listen, can I tell you something? I visit more people in hospitals that don't go to our church than I do in our church. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm not tooting my horn, but that's a heart of a servant. Otherwise, I'd stay at home and say, hey, I don't get paid to do that. They're not a member of mine. They don't tithe to the church and all of that. But I want to tell you something. I'm not going to apologize because I visited. And I had somebody to send me a message about it and say, Preacher, I'm sorry, I can't. But I want to tell you something here. Hey, there was no malice. I went to visit somebody. And can I tell you another thing while I'm on it? When I was walking into the hospital, I passed church members of this person who did not go and visit them while they were in the hospital. Now, am I trying... Listen, can I infer and I want to say this for the record. This church has a tremendous pastor. I respect him, love him. I'm not, I'm not casting shade. I'm just saying, people get nosy. And sometimes it's really, sometimes it's not worth posting something and saying, because you never know how people are going to take it. When I posted, I went, and I want you to pray. I, ho I was hoping we'd get a lot of people together praying, for the, because the woman asked me, she said, have everybody praying for us. That's, it wasn't to say, listen, I'm out here visiting and somebody else didn't. But again, it goes back to nosiness and nosy in other people's business and all that kind of stuff. And again, not casting shade. That's just the devil, how the devil works, okay? So let's get back here to the, the part of the message here. Both of these men were the exact same distance from Jesus that day. Matthew 27, 44 says, and they both began shouting the same ugly things. But then something happened. One of them changed. One of them changed. If you get born again, you will change. And you might not like that preaching, but when you get saved, God changes you. I'm getting so sick and tired of a world that has so many religious people in it. They know the Bible. They know the church rhetoric. They know the ins and the outs of the church. But they act like the world when they're in it. And they walk in the house of God. And they holler amen. And they look like a hypocrite. And then they're wondering why people don't want to come to the house of God. Because they see how they are outside the church. Folks, I'm going to tell you, buddy, this ain't a tugboat. This is a, this is a battleship. And you better be ready when you get saved to understand that you're going to have more lows than you have highs. But one of them changed that day. We preach a lot about the thief that repented on the cross, and we admire his conviction. Buddy, we use that to remind people, listen, you don't have to get baptized to go to heaven. The thief on the cross didn't walk down and say, Jesus, baptize me. People say, I don't believe in deathbed salvation. Well, you might as well because that thief, he was on his deathbed. God knows the heart. The Bible says He knows the thoughts and the intents of our heart. Listen, quit worrying about what people think. Man don't decide that. If man decided anything, I wouldn't be preaching today. Matter of fact, I'd be in hell because there's a lot of people that think I should have, should have went there back in my heyday. Listen, boy, aren't you glad that God gives us a free will? God didn't. You know what? God didn't throw me into hell, even though I deserved it. He gave me a free will to decide for myself, and I'm thankful for that. But I want to look at the other thief for just a minute. You know, we rejoice over the one sinner that repents. The Bible says the angels in heaven rejoice. I see people all the time record their altar calls. We don't do it here. I think that's personal. I don't, I don't think that we should have a camera on somebody up here pouring their heart out to God to try to make their church look spiritual. I think that is garbage. But I'll tell you something. You, you've got churches, a lot of big churches, and they, oh, 27 got saved today. 
45 got saved, yada, 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 yada. The Bible says the angels in heaven rejoice over one that repents. Ever, I've told you folks in our church for all the years I've been pastoring that one of them, we get one to come forth, thank God, hug their neck, shake their hand, let's follow them, keep up with them, encourage them and everything. One. Because the Bible says he left the 99 to go after the one. So, but let's talk about this man a minute. Should we feel the need to cry out today to the Lord and, uh, uh, on behalf of this man? The one that railed against Jesus and the one that didn't reach out for mercy? You know, I wonder in our hearts, if we were back then as church people, would we say, Lord, give him a little bit more time. Lord, you're long-suffering. Lord, can you give that man on the cross over there just a little more? I know he's saying all these bad things about you. But Lord, could you just give him a little bit more time? Lord, I mean, he's on his deathbed, and it doesn't look like, hey, I've visited people on their deathbed before, and I've had people to get saved, and I believe with all my heart they got saved. I've, I've visited people on their deathbed before that couldn't even acknowledge anything other than shake their head or move their eyes. But I know that they're hearing. The hearing's the last thing to go. And I know, listen, you don't have to mumble them lips. You can have, listen, you can pray without even moving your mouth or anything like that. I don't know, but I can tell you this right here. For my family, and for my church family, and for the people that I try to be a blessing to and witness to, I always pray, God, if you would just allow some, some more long-suffering. Because one day it's going to end. One day the last sinner is going to walk the aisle. One day the, last preaching, uh, the preacher is going to preach the last message. One day it's all going to be over. So I always pray, God, give them an opportunity to be saved. But if we were there that day, what would we be praying? Would we say, Lord, just, uh, can you just wait? Uh, Jesus, don't give up the ghost yet. I mean, just hang on a little bit longer. I want to see him get saved. But he had a choice. So I want you to think about something this morning. I said a minute ago that the shepherd left the 99 to go after the one. I preached a couple of months ago on the, the parable of the lost coin. The Bible said that lady went absolutely nuts trying to find the coin. Now, she didn't have a light on or nothing. She swept. She looked. One coin. But she took all. You know what? She had determination. She was going to find that lost coin. Listen, I preach as your pastor to encourage you, but I want to see people get saved. When we go to the flea market and pass out tracts, I'm not doing that just to say we went to the flea market. I don't know, I don't know, 99% of those people. But I know they got a soul, and I know they're the lost coin, and I know that somebody's got to go looking for them. So the, lost, the, the parable of the lost coin reminds us that she continues to sweep and look. And then I found something interesting. So if you look at both of those things, the shepherd leaves the 99, the woman goes looking for the lost coin, but then, all of a sudden, something happens. See, they both do something in those parables. But listen to this. Have you ever thought about this? How about the most popular parable out there? The parable of the prodigal son. Can I tell you something? In that parable, the father didn't go looking for the son. Do you realize that? Father didn't do anything. Right? The son came back on his own. The father wasn't out there looking. And so now I understand something. Here's what I found out. I understand that the sheep, the one that went missing from the, from the 90 or from the 100, he didn't leave intentionally. He, he left innocently. He was out here just looking around or whatever, and oh, look, kind of like our, our dog Bo. You go outside and he tell him to do his business, and hey, y'all seen him? He's a big old Great Pyrenees. And he'll back, he looks like a dump truck when he goes to do his business. He backs up, and puts it in gear, and all of a sudden, and you're like, all right, he's about to release. And then he'll look up and he's like, oh, leaf, and he'll take off running. That's what reminds me of the lost sheep here. You just had a little lamb, and he's looking all over the world, and everything's all glitz and glitter, and he's like, man. And then before you know it, he's separated. That's innocent. That's innocently lost. Now let me tell you about another one. The coin was lost irresponsibly. It was lost. It was just laid around, got lost, dropped, whatever. If it was secure, it wouldn't have been lost. That was irresponsible. But let me tell you something about the prodigal son. That was intentional. Nobody made him leave. Nobody made him leave. Can I tell you something today? For all you that get out of the will of God, nobody makes you do that. That's your choice. 
It's your choice to leave church. It's your choice to hop around and do the kangaroo dance and hop from church to church to church and say, well, God spoke to me. How is God speaking to you when you don't even come to church faithful? You're not, you, you don't read your Bible. You don't pray. You don't have a, a zest and a zeal and a desire for lost people. But yet God all of us, you know, God never speaks to anybody about anything else unless it's leaving church. You ever noticed that? That's why churches struggle. Because they can't get faithful people to come to the house of God. They're always looking for something else. That's intentional. That's intentional. Does God move people out of church? Sure He does. But I can tell you one thing. I don't believe that God takes anybody from a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church that has a zest for souls and missions and all of that and does everything and lines up with a New Testament church because you know what, you know what drags people to other churches? Things. Chasing the money. They got more money. They can have big gospel singings. They can do this. They can have, you know, all these things that they can do. That's what draw a lot of people. And then the other thing that dra drags them away is just, honestly, I believe it's maturity. They cannot get into a disagreement with a brother and sister in Christ and work it out. They got to have a disagreement, and then they got to drag half the church with them and give them their side and get them to move on down the road. I'm going to tell you one thing. God help the people that follow people out of a church. God help them. You think God speaks through one and moves the whole crowd? I don't believe that. Not at all. So, understand, it's a choice. Now, let me tell you something about choices. i got a couple minutes and we're going to let you go here. Listen. Because you, you need this this morning. My stepson, Tommy. I had to bring him up because we saw him a couple weeks ago. So, But I was thinking about this. Tommy decided that he wanted to he was he was gonna he was gonna he was going to college here, but he decided his girlfriend lived in Florida. His dad's down there. Florida is a fun state. I mean, they got the best governor in the world, by the way, uh, DeSantis. I mean, man, I'd trade I'd trade I'd trade half the state for him, amen, just to get him here. But anyway, but he he goes down there. What teenager don't want to go to Florida? Beaches, girls, right? Fishing poles, Tim. Up your alley, except for the girls, and I know you're married. Listen to me. But, uh, uh, you know, anybody in their right mind at 19 years old would want to go to Florida, right? But we warned him. Here's what we said. When you go, you're going to have a lot of distractions, but you need to enroll in school. You need to finish. You need to get your, you know, degree or certification, whatever you're working towards, so you can get your job and yada, yada, yada. Sherry and me, we both taught him, you got to save money and this, that, and the other. Well, Tommy's in Florida. He, d he doesn't save nothing. Uh, he's having some issues, and but here's the thing. We told him, and I was very adamant, if you leave, the only responsibility you got is keep your room clean, right, and, and work and go to school. That's it. That's pretty good. Most of us would all move back in home if, if, if we were invited. But we told him, we said, when you go and you make this decision, you're not coming back. Now, he can come back to North Carolina. I'm not that, you know, I'm not going to ban him from the state, all right, but he's not moving back in. Taylor the same way. I told her. She goes out, she gets married and all that kind of stuff. They all have the opportunity. But they have a choice. He made the choice to go. Now he's not asked to come back home. But I use that as an example because there, we told him there's going to be consequences. And there are consequences to our actions. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. When we disobey God, there's consequences. When we make a choice and God gives us, well, well God gave me a choice. He sure did. But it's your responsibility to make the right one. And when you make the wrong one, there's going to be, you're going to have consequences. And a lot of times that consequence is with the Lord. So understand something today, folks. Jesus gave both of these criminals the same choice. Sometimes God will send thunder to stir us up. Sometimes He sends us blessings to lure us in. But listen to this. Other times He remains silent and He honors our decision to make our own choice. How about that? See, there's a lot of areas in your life you don't have any choice. You know what that means? That means gender. I've got news for these people out here running around trying to change, letting their kids change their sex. An eight-year-old boy decides he wants to be a girl. You know whose problem that is? You know who needs to be knocked in the head, mom and dad? I mean, that's ridiculous. Get them in church. An eight-year-old has no idea. But now we've got a sexually active young generation that's starting way young because it's being taught to them and it's being preached to them and it's being glorified and all that kind of stuff. And, and all these kids running around thinking they're a dog and, and a cat. And in school you identify as a cat and, 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 and the principal's got to respect that. I mean, man, are we living in the twilight zone or what? 
It's craziness. Somebody's talking about my grandfather would roll over. Man, my grandfather wouldn't just roll over, Gary. He'd find a shovel and dig his way out and come out here and try to change stuff. It's ridiculous. But that's where we're at. But listen, you didn't have a choice in your gender. You didn't have a choice to what family you were going to be born in. You didn't have a choice to if you're going to be able to sing or be an athlete or any of that. That wasn't your choice before you were born. All right? People get angry about their lack of choice, especially in this woke society. It's not fair. What about these reparations? Oh, we're going to pay reparations because, uh, you know, 100 years ago, my grandfather's 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 brother's uncle's sister's dog's nephew uh, was a slave. So we're going to pay the family and all of that. Listen, can I tell you something? There were black slaves and there were white slaves, right? I mean, there's people that have, have did bad things to all kinds of people, black, white, purple, green, and, and I feel for that. But we're in a society today, people are angry. And so they say, well, since I'm born white, I don't have a pr the privilege of playing basketball because white men can't jump. So I need to get reparations. Or you have a black family who says, I was born in poverty in Harlem and that's not fair and I need to get reparations. Nobody's happy with their life. You're never going to be happy in this life unless you have Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're never going to find happiness. So remember, listen to this, in the Garden of Eden, Eric, i got five minutes, I'm closing here. The scale of things being fair were tipped that day when God planted that tree. He gave Adam and Eve a choice. God planted the tree, but they made the choice. That's when the scales of fairness were tipped for the life that we live in now. God gave us the opportunity to make our choices. So, I want you to think about it today. Would you rather make choices in this life than for God to make the choice for you? Because if God, who is fair and just, if He made the choice right now, every single one of us would be in hell. Every single one of us. But He gives us the free will to decide. What if we got a la carte in this life? You know what that is? I can, I can create my body. Everybody's doing that now. I'm like, I seen a lady on the other day. Danny Thomas's daughter. Y'all know who she is? Was her name Marla or something? She was on one of these shows. I forget, uh, but they had her on there. And for a minute, it, she caught me by surprise because I remember seeing her doing the, the, the commercials and everything and for the children. And all of a sudden, I looked and I was like, wait a minute. And I actually took my remote and I went backwards and I looked and I was like, what in the world is wrong with her face? She looked like Joyce Meyer's sister with all the plastic surgery. Her nose, I don't know how she breathed out of it. Now seriously, people are altering their faces and they're altering... Listen, ladies, I get makeup and I thank God for it sometimes. I really do. Uh, that one just speaks for itself, amen. And beards. And beards, that's right. But uh, oh, on ladies? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, anyway. So, yeah, sometimes, that's right. Uh, but I want, I want you to think about this, though. Everybody won't alter themselves. I want my nose to look different. I want this to look different. I want, you know what? And can I tell you something? You've got a choice to do every bit of that. You want to lose weight? You can lose weight. You want to, you know, you want to grow a beard? You can grow a beard. You can, I mean, you've got a choice to make. So think about it. A la carte in this life. What if we got to choose exactly how we look and all of that before time began. What would you choose? Would you choose to be really pretty or really handsome? And would you choose, what if you only got five things out of ten? Well, I can be rich, but I really would like to be an athlete. But if I'm rich, I'm not going to be able to play basketball. Or, and you've got to pick what you want in your life. You think you'd be happy? If you got five things that you got to pick, you wouldn't be happy. But I want to tell you something about choices. And here's where I'm going to close at. If we look at the man on the cross that obtained mercy in 2022, and as judgmental as we are, we would say, you know what, that guy had a wasted life. He wasted his whole life. But can I tell you this, and this is such, I was, boy, I just got excited about this. Where's he at now? Is the man on the cross who got mercy, is he reaping through eternity all of his bad decisions? No. 
the one good decision he made changed everything. Now, I want you to think about that today. The one decision. Folks, there's people in here, you've got a bad past. You've had things to happen to you. As a Christian, we don't need to look in our rearview mirror. The one choice you made to accept Christ as your Savior, can I tell you something? It outweighs every bit of the bad choices you've ever made. So he's not reaping, he's not reaping bad decisions in heaven. He's reaping the one good decision, the one good choice he made. So there's people here today, you've chosen the wrong friends. You've chosen the wrong career. Maybe some people feel like they've chosen the wrong spouse. And I'm not saying that jokingly. But I've heard people say, if I could go back, preacher, and change just this one thing, if I could make up for my bad choices, well, let me tell you something today, you can. One good choice for your eternity offsets a million bad things that you've ever done in your life. Today, the choice is yours. He's letting you decide. I want you to stand, heads bowed and eyes closed. I preach for about 40 minutes.